welcome to California Conversations. My name is Chuck Dick. I am the co-chair of the program committee for California Arbitration, CalArb, as we now are coming to know it. Uh, and it's my privilege today to uh, conduct a, an interview with a fellow arbitrator here in California that I've had the privilege of getting to know over the past couple of months as we prepared for this interview. We have today, I think, maybe one of the most eclectic uh, backgrounds that has given rise to an ADR practitioner of anybody I know. And I, I am delighted to introduce you to Gada Audi, and we're going to share a few minutes uh, with her this, to this day to find out a little bit more about her background and her practice in California. But let's start by having you just explain a little bit about your career path and leading up to this position you have now as an ADR practitioner. Thank you so much, Chuck, for uh, having me on your program. And um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you today. Um, sure. Uh, to kick it off, um, you know, I came to a bat to ADR really through different paths. And, um, and and maybe as you said, I've had some uh, different experiences that uh, brought me to the being an ADR practitioner. Um, for me, I actually undertook uh, studies at the University of Cologne Institute for International and Foreign Private Law many moons ago. And I still look at that as the underpinning of my current career in ADR. Um, it was a, a, a research year um, in conflicts of law and comparative law. And, uh, you know, fast forward a few years, uh, I had the realization that it had actually been the best preparation possible for a career in international arbitration. Um, I have held many hats during my career. Uh, I am a multidisciplinary person by nature, and so I've gravitated towards that. I think for me, I draw from my different experiences and discipline to be able to solve problems, um, and it's, I think, served me very well. Um, I really look at my role with the, the uh, Dubai International Financial Center Court where I had a quasi-judicial function, I really believe that taught me what I know about case management, very important in arbitration, of course. Um, but also, you know, um, it served as a supervisory court over arbitrations. And that interplay between courts and arbitration is ever so important. Um, of course, being an in-house practitioner taught me so much about the context in which disputes arise. Being in the seat of general counsel and explaining the process to business colleagues, understanding how business colleagues uh, looked at a dispute in real time and really understanding that tension and the need to have a speedy answer, I think infuses quite a bit my practice as an arbitrator. Um, at the end of the day, parties need a resolution to their dispute. And the speed in which that happens, of course, is, is very important and a reason why a number of parties choose arbitration over uh, taking their dispute to court. Um, Private practice, of course, taught me the ins and outs of advocacy. And uh, I think that's, of course, extremely important. Um, and more recently, as I've gone into the startup world, um, both in the capacity as a co-founder of a luxury brand, uh, but also advising startups, um, I realize again that you know innovation is so important and key. And in arbitration as well, we have to keep uh, making the process even better. And we have to, we can't rest on our lawyer, laurels. We have to keep innovating. Well, you have just laid out a little bit of that eclecticism that I was referring to. 
Uh, let's go back and try to dissect that just a little bit, because one of the things that I found most fascinating about your background and experience uh, involves your time in Dubai, and maybe you can amplify a little bit on that part as we move through the varied portions of your background. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, with great pleasure. Um, I worked in Dubai for 10 years, and during that time, I was with the court, so uh, a common law English-speaking court based in the financial center of Dubai. It is, in fact, a jurisdiction within a jurisdiction, um, and uh, it had its own laws that were based very much on common law um, uh, you know, it, it, what, it had its own laws that were promulgated for the DIFC, but very heavily based on UK common law, I wanted to say. And um, from there, I uh, moved back into private practice and I uh, was handling arbitration cases um, uh, as counsel. Uh, and then an opportunity came up that I just said I couldn't pass up. It was to go in-house uh, for a, um, a UAE family conglomerate uh, that had a num several business units. And they were mainly in retail, but also luxury and fashion, uh, as well as real estate. And um, they had a separate single family office as well. Uh, so it was an opportunity to go in as their first in-house counsel and to build a legal department from scratch. Um, and of course, um, it was an opportunity to run uh, the, the, the arbitration case, uh, one in particular that comes to mind that, um, you know, was a game changer for understanding um, the intricacies of how an, how an arbitration can affect your colleagues and how, as the general counsel, uh, you need to make sure that you're, you know, you're, you're not just handling that uh, in a vacuum with, with your external counsel. Everything has to refer back to the company in terms of setting the direction for the arbitration. What do the part, what do, what do we want from it? as an outcome, um, how do you get the evidence from all of the holders of the information that you need and making it easy for your colleagues to be able to support your case? Uh, so I think that was a, a tremendous learning experience. Um, the sector that I was in, luxury and uh, retail, really taught me everything that I know about relationships including how to preserve them. Um, I think when you're in-house, you know, you also learn a thing or two about dispute avoidance. And that was always something that I would preach first and foremost. Um, it would be kind of a, a last resort, but when you do have to resort to resolving a dispute, uh, the use of ADR, I think is such a key tool in a, you know, general counsel's toolbox in order to get a speedy resolution of the dispute. And in many cases, you, you, you want to try to preserve a relationship. You may need to uh, take care of that in, you know, through arbitration or mediation, uh, but ultimately it may be that the parties want to continue working together. One of the things that I've found fascinating about your background is, is its geographic diversity. You, you had the benefit of not only working and, and studying and, and growing in very diverse parts of the world, but that's also carries with it some uh, cultural mix. And I, I'd be interested to know, as you reflect back on it, how how living and working in these various environments around the globe has contributed to your your sense of professionalism and, and the judgment you bring to bear now as a neutral. Well, thank you. I think it teaches you quite a bit, uh, Chuck. You're right. You know, working um, with the, in different legal cultures with, um, you know, very diverse colleagues from, uh, you know, in Dubai, uh, in the company that I was with, uh, we there were 80 different nationalities represented 
within the country, within the, the company. And, um, you know, I think that it, it just brings this perspective of uh, people want to be heard. They want to be appreciated for, you know, their background, and they want to work with somebody that has exposure to a lot of different backgrounds and cultures. I think it just creates a, a, an environment of, of you know, uh, of trust, and that is so key in this very intimate setting of arbitration. Uh, where, you know, your arbitrator is really guiding the parties through a process. And uh, parties, I think, first and foremost, want to be heard and uh, listened to. And I think I've uh, learned a thing or two about that through, in many different cultural settings. Well, most of us embark upon our careers uh, and, and focus uh, more or less exclusively on the practice of law or perhaps the, as that might lead to a career in alternative dispute resolution but you've actually had this this variety of work experiences uh, not just as a lawyer but as a consultant and as a, a businesswoman and uh, I wish you could share with us a little bit more about your consultancy experiences and how that has informed you as a professional now. Yes, for sure. Um, you know, working with startups um, has really taught me quite a bit about, um, you know, the 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 not only that your you know people have dedicated their career to coming up with something new and innovative, um, but so much of that is uh, setting up a company from scratch. And, you know, I really am a firm believer of, you know, tone at the top and everything that is done uh, between the small group, core group of individuals that are setting up a company will trickle down ultimately throughout the entire organization. And I think that's something that really, um, you know, gives me a lot of inspiration in terms of, you know, what is really important in a company. First of all, it's its people. Um, it's the uh, it's the ultimate product or service that they provide. And in this world today of how is it set within our our constraints of um, climate change and you know all of the world problems that we face today. Uh, so I, I find it really fascinating to be able to work with uh, startups that are solving really important um, issues and also providing uh, goods and services for, um, for consumers that are looking for something different. So now you find your way to California and that's got to be an interesting story in and of its own self. So maybe you can tell us how you arrived in the Golden State. Yes, you know, um, I had lived abroad for many years. Um, California was not my first home in the US. Uh, but after living in a place as dynamic as the United Arab Emirates, um, and especially in, in, in Dubai, where, um, you know, innovation is just everywhere. I think one of the, the taglines for Dubai is the future is now. And that was really the case. Um, it, things were moving at a very fast pace in Dubai and across sectors. Um, even to the extent that, uh, you know, there's a, a, a space program uh, in, in the UAE. And um, so many innovations happening. Um, for me, as a lawyer, I was always benchmarking uh, my work uh, to California and, you know, in-house counsel that were, were situated in California. And, you know, the the uh, it, every industry was moving more and more towards tech, including retail, including uh, luxury and fashion. And it was for me very important to see the extent of where that movement was going and to place myself in an environment where I could continue to, to learn and absorb that, um, that, that new, in, those new innovations into my work and into my practice. Um, you know, omni-channel retail really changed the game. 
um, the different uh, payment platforms, if you think about it, ha have been changing the game. Uh, the circular economy is changing the game. And all of those innovations were really kind of coming out of Northern California. On the other hand, I was also involved on in um, angel investing. And of course, as a lawyer for a single family office, you know, investments were crossing my desk on a daily basis. And where is the epicenter of uh, investment? It's still Silicon Valley. So to be in that ecosystem was very important for me. Well, as you come now to California, share with us your real life experiences uh, now that you, you have arrived and are bringing this, this uh, very large piece of luggage with you full of, of your work experiences. How have you found practice in California? I find it really fascinating. I mean, first and foremost, when you think about California as the you know, fourth largest economy in the world, um, every industry is represented here. And for someone like me, who's had a lot of international experience, um, it's, it's a place where I can see a lot of international trade happening in front of me. Um, you know, the extent of projects that happen between California and even the Middle East um, are extensive in a number of industries. Everything from the, the retail brands that are represented in the Middle East, um, let's not even mention technology and, you know, energy um, for, are just a few examples, but also in the entertainment space. Uh, and all of those are really major industries in California. Uh, again, because I've had experience in Europe and um, in my earlier days, you know, I, I was also a double major of Spanish. Uh, being located here in California, the extent of um, trade that happens with Mexico, but also the Far East as well, really excites me. And I'm, I'm really privileged to be placed in a jurisdiction that has so many opportunities to, to work in an international context. Well, you had shared with me uh, your recent attendance at the ICDR Americas Conference in, in Mexico, uh, and perhaps you can share with our, our viewers here today a little bit about uh, how rich that experience was as you found it. I, I found it really fascinating. Um, you know, Mexico has recently surpassed China as the number one trade partner for the U.S. And, you know, the, the important agreements between Mexico, the U.S. and Canada um, can, can only be underscored. And what I got to do uh, during that conference was really get to know other ADR professionals that are um, doing outstanding work across the Americas and to, you know, for me to reconnect also with my love of the language and um, to, to really, you know, see and, and get to know and network with uh, colleagues. Um, I was also really impressed with many of the things that I heard from uh, the new AAA ICDR president, uh, Bridget McCormick, who comes from a court background. And you know, one thing that really resonated with me a lot was um, how she viewed the importance of ADR. You know, she she said it um, very clearly that you know court systems today cannot manage without ADR. They are so they are just you know they have to go hand in hand. Otherwise, courts would be overwhelmed. And um, that again gave me renewed. Um, you know, renewed thought about, you know, why it is so important for ADR to, to flourish and how I could be part of that. Well, as you uh, reflect on your experiences here in California to date, I wonder if you could describe for uh, our viewers how you view your, what, what your niche is, I guess is maybe a better way of putting it. What, as your background now brings you to, to the forefront, uh, share with us where you think your strong suits are. Oh, well, thank you. Um, you know, of course, commercial disputes that result 
from breach of license agreements, distribution, so investment agreements. This is kind of the bread and butter um, commercial dispute practice. Uh, but beyond that, I really see that uh, the importance of having nuanced arbitrators that really understand the luxury industry. Um, in California alone, you know, luxury is synonymous with a number of brands, uh, clothing, apparel, um, jewelry, watches, but beyond that, furniture, um, and also cars, and even technology companies. Uh, so I think, um, you know, where where I come into that is especially in, in, in understanding the nuanced relationships. Um, supply chain could mean very different things based on different industries. Um, in, in the, the luxury world, um, you know, image is so important as well as reputation. Having an understanding about the different collections and seasons and the timing uh, can also be very critical for parties who are in a dispute and need an arbitrator that not only understands process, but also under, has a deep seated knowledge of the industry. And again, when I bring up, you know, license agreements, uh, you know, IP license agreements is a very major um, uh, theme uh, in, in these disputes. And so having someone who understands uh, IP, I think, is 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 very helpful to 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 parties and in, in arbitration or or mediations. Well, you've made several references to luxury brands, and I can't resist asking you a little bit about this new uh, business venture that you've launched into. I I don't know how on top of your busy professional life you fit this in, but you've managed so far to succeed. And tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a, an entrepreneur in the luxury brand business? Yeah. Um, of course, you know, the, the climate today um, in getting investments is a little bit trickier than it may have been uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so that's always, you know, one of the overriding things that you have to think about is, you know, the, the funding for your venture and how you will find like-minded partners that are going to um, in, invest in you and help you to take your vision uh, and, and dream to the next level. Um, I was so fortunate to get to know the founder and creative director of the brand. Um, he's a Dutch Japanese national, and he was an architect who really found his passion in designing women's footwear. And as we started to get into talks, um, what became really apparent about how we support each other in, in this venture is my understanding of the retail sales of products, um, even though I did that from, with my lawyer hat on, uh, once you are inside of a business and you're holding a C-suite position, um, you know, all of that, that is happening in front of you. You can't separate yourself and say, I'm just the lawyer. Uh, it the the role demands that you you know roll up your sleeves. You're working side by side with your your you know your business colleagues. You're bringing the legal lens, but you know you're you're part of the team. And uh, so that understanding of you know distribution um, and and how to retail and and set up a retail network, I think was extremely you know valuable to the venture. In addition to that, you know, having worked with a portfolio of over 60 very niche brands, I really got to understand the DNA behind these different brands. And I help infuse that, you know, that learning into how we present ourselves as a brand. Um, so a lot of it is, you know, brand building um, and retail, but in addition to that, there are all the legal issues that still happen. Everything from, um, you know, employment to, um, to you know, supply chain uh, and 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 privacy. Of course, um, when we talk about retail sales in an omni-channel world, and uh, for me, that has just been kind of a, a dream that. Uh, really came true in a place like California. 
<laughs> so again, you know, situating myself in a place where um, there is this idea of self-made um, and that innovation and this environment really fosters it um, is very much a California story. I know that you have described for us a bit your experience both as an advocate and as uh, an arbitrator in the resolution of commercial disputes, but uh, I, I know also that mediation is a component of your professional life today. And uh, perhaps you can take just a few minutes and share how your background has contributed to your effectiveness in trying to help people mediate or informally resolve their disputes. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I really think that when um, when parties get to the point where they need to air their grievances, um, it's not always good for it, it's not it's rarely good for business. And for many of the entities that I've worked with in my career, you know, discretion is really paramount. Uh, you can't just air your dirty laundry in in public. Um, as I was saying, there's so much regarding image and reputation that could be at stake. Uh, so resorting to mediation can be a, a much better way to handle the dispute. Um, there are just so many sensitive relationships. So from the, for example, with between startup um, uh, partners and co-founders, uh, imagine that kind of, uh, you know, relationship that is, has been forged. And if a dispute arises, um, it, it can have detri detrimental effect for the company itself and all of the stakeholders that have been involved. For example, the investors. Um, having worked in a family business, a multi-generational family business, I think also taught me a significant amount about how you have to keep the peace, right? It is, you, you not only work with these people, but you, you know, you go home to these people and they're part of your extended family. And so it taught me a significant amount about how to, you know, uh, maintain, how to restore after conflict a, and, and resolve a dispute so that um, everyone can move forward. Um, uh, we are so lucky to have uh, enlisted your uh, energy and your uh, wisdom as a, a key player in California arbitration. And uh, I, I would like to have you share uh, with those who are listening to this interview how you got involved and what roles you're playing with California arbitration and why, why are you taking your extracurricular time and spending it with us? <laughs> Uh, well, first and foremost, you know, I think California arbitration, um, we, we always seek out like-minded individuals and uh, arbitration is a, uh, it brings together a community of practitioners that, um, you know, I hold as my tribe. And so in, in coming to California, it was very important for me to, to network and get to know other international arbitrators and mediators um, and also to, you know, get involved in a, an organization that I believe very strongly in its mission. Um, I, you know, California, we're, we're talking about it as a seat of international arbitration. Um, and it, it just has all of the elements that make it a very important place to consider if you're going to have a dispute. Everything from the relationship between arbitral institutions and the courts and the way that courts, supervisory courts, um, uh, address arbitration uh, is, is so important. Um, the extent and the depth of the uh, arbitration practitioner bar, for example, is, is, is incredible. And um, all, of the, all of the things that you would need to have an important seat are right here. And it, it just, it, it actually surprised me that it was a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a, a, a lesser known kind of secret in a way. Um, and so really being able to share that with a larger community is, is, has been very important. 
Another reason that I'm, you know, so proud to be part of uh, California arbitration is the focus on um, the, you know, the future arbitrators of tomorrow. Um, I'm very active with the Young Cal Arb uh, through my position as um, on the executive committee. I am the liaison to the Young Cal Arb uh, leaders, and um, that for me has just always been a very important thread. I've taught before at universities, and I think we have to continually nurture uh, the, the pool of arbitrators and mediators who are coming up and are coming next. Uh, through the Membership and Diversity uh, Committee, which I'm a co-chair, we're, we're also really focused on getting the word out about CalArb. And uh, we have over 200 members now, and uh, we're hopeful that more people will join us in this mission. And uh, for anyone listening, that you can go on to the California Arbitration website, and you can uh, very easily go to the membership page and, and sign up and join us. Um, we're doing a few very interesting projects through the Membership and Diversity Committee. It's too early to announce them, so watch this space. Uh, but again, it's really rooted in this uh, place of uh, diversity and really attracting uh, new uh, arbitrators and mediators to, to, to join the tribe. A minute or so ago, you used the word future, and that's a perfect segue uh, to the next question I'd like to put to you. Uh, you have spent a great deal of your time looking at what might be possible, what might be within our reach, what could we do? And I, I, I really would like to have you share with us your thoughts and visions about what is going to be the future here for our practice in California. Uh, well, I think that it's going to continue to uh, really be recognized for all of the um, all of the the infrastructure that's already there. And um, I think as we see, you know, in in many places, um, um, uh, the 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 innovation and that innovate an innovation spirit uh, will permeate and will really uh, help not only the practitioners to provide a more efficient service, but also shape the way in which uh, the end users uh, want arbitration to be presented to them. So I I do think that you know many of the advances that we're seeing in online type of um, dispute resolution will will also continue to take hold. You know, we for a little while, there was a lot of talk about arbitration in the metaverse. I don't think we're there yet, but, you know, knowing that those things are, are on the way, I think we are very well suited here in California to be um, ahead of the curve and help to roll some of those innovations out. Well, on that very encouraging and uh, optimistic note, let me just stop and say thank you very much, Gada Audi. Uh, I, I announced at the beginning this would be a most interesting interview, and it has been a delight to make your acquaintance, to get to know a little bit more about you, and I, I'm really grateful on behalf of all of those who are going to be viewing this that you took the time to share a little bit about your background, your work experiences, and your your views of the future with those of us who have got a lot to learn from you. So with the expression of gratitude from California Arbitration, let us just say thanks for sharing your day with us. Thank you so much, Chuck. I enjoyed the conversation immensely.